Well, 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 just welcome to another episode of Hablemos de Bitcoin that is brought to you by Leren.io, Bitrefield, and Hodl Hodl. Today we are going to have an English conversation with Gif Sangane, that is part of Tether, and he is the head of Lugano Plan B, and we discussed about what is Lugano Plan B, what are their goals, what are they are looking to build in the city of Lugano and well we have a really nice conversation about Lugano Plan B Forum that is going to happen in a month. Now we are going to start but remember that this podcast Hablemos de Bitcoin is sponsored by Letend.io, Bitrefill and Hodl Hodl. Well, uh, Welcome back to another episode of Hablemos de Bitcoin. This time we are going to do it in English because our guest is uh, from Switzerland or is uh, working in Switzerland. And we are going to discuss uh, a little about uh, Lugano Plan B and also his background and his relation with uh, Bitcoin. But I want to uh, welcome you to Hablemos de Bitcoin, Guy. Is the good way to pronounce your name or how, how should it, it go? <laughs> sure, there, there is a V at the end, so it's give. Okay, But, perfect. Yeah, no worries. Give Sangane, who is part of Tether and also head of Plan B. And we are going to talk, as I said, about the, the project of Plan B there in Lugano, but also about the conference that is about to come. But before that, I want to ask you how long have you been involved in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and also what were you doing before this, before getting involved in this industry? Sure, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to to be here on your on your podcast. Uh, I'm very happy to be there. Uh, yeah. So my background is actually in engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer. From from what I studied, I did actually a PhD in mechanical engineering, where I was developing energy storage technologies and solar technologies. And um, um, so my cultural background is quite mixed. Uh, I am born in the German part of Switzerland, but then I grew up in Iran. Then I lived in Indonesia, I lived in Canada, um, and now I'm living in the south of Switzerland where we speak Italian. So I have been, been around a bit. Uh, I even actually, actually have family in Venezuela, and uh, I actually did send them Bitcoin in 2019 when they, and there was kind of a necessity in, in the family to, to send money. And I was like, okay, well, how am I going to send uh, money to Venezuela? And I was like, I'm going to send you Bitcoin and, and it worked out great. Um, so, um, yeah, basically I had, um, like everybody, I had maybe a couple of touch points with Bitcoin. Uh, the first one must have been in 2014, I guess. I don't even remember exactly. It was just a headline of some Bloomberg article, something like obscure internet money used in the dark net crashes or something like that. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't even dig deeper into it, uh, because it was just, I mean, there was just a headline and, um, Then later in 2017, um, with the with the next bubble, let's say the next hype cycle, I I got a bit more interested more about about Bitcoin and blockchain and crypto and stuff. I started entering like everybody doing a bit of altcoining uh, and, and blockchaining and stuff. Um, but basically, due to my background, it was kind of an easy sell Bitcoin itself because I mean. I lived in Iran, I used, so you see like 30% inflation year over year over year. You see being excluded from international monetary systems. Uh, you see that you're not able to interact uh, financially with anybody outside of your country. So it's it's kind of it's kind of obvious that we need something like Bitcoin, where just anybody can transact with uh, from any corner of the world to any corner of the world, just uh, basically at light of a speed of light or 10 minutes or whatever you want, uh, much much faster than any alternative in any case. Um, so so that was basically the touch point then of when I uh, started uh, getting to crypto and blockchain. I started actually working on a couple of projects. Um, on, on, on blockchain things. I then worked actually for a consulting firm that was um, where I was basically trying to make uh, blockchain use cases. Um, so it was an international consulting firm where I would um, try with different companies to see, okay, where can we use blockchain? Um, and I was also on a, on a working group from the Swiss Federal Office of Energy where we were looking into understanding 
how we can use the blockchain to settle basically um, energy energy production and consumption. And the um, outcome of all of these efforts was that basically blockchain doesn't really have lots of use cases. Like uh, there are like you need you need the blockchain only and exclusively if you do not want to trust anybody. I think this is, if you want to simplify a bit the use case, that's, that's the case. So as long as there is, you are trusting one entity anyway, be it the government, be it the company, be it an institution, be it an organization, which we almost always have, um, you don't really need the blockchain. The blockchain just increases uh, the friction. It uh, reduces the efficiency. You, you have extra redundancy that is not necessary. So, um, Kind of, uh, you always. I, I got more and more into the the conviction um, with basically facts and and, and experience that um, Bitcoin is basically probably one of the only use cases where you really need to have a blockchain um, with the characteristics that it has. I mean, we can then discuss about all the other altcoins and stuff, but that is basically the where where I arrived at. Oh, perfect, perfect. That's that's a way that we can uh, better understand your background and also the experience that you uh, are bringing to to Tether. But before we are going to Tether and Lugano and all the stuff, but I want to uh, go through your Twitter bio that says that you are a renew, renewable energy and energy storage veteran. So I want to know what's that and if if it's somehow related to to Bitcoin and, and crypto mining and all the stuff, but also in the context of the energy crisis that is heading to Europe because of the conflict between of Russia and Ukraine. So it could be really interesting to have your point of view as you're a, an energy veteran, so go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, well, I consider myself like a renewable energy and energy storage veteran because a big part of my professional life, I was working on developing, um, first of all, solar energy technologies and then energy storage technologies um, and energy storage technologies specifically for the use of integrating renewable energy into the grid. Um, so the project where I was most of the time working on specifically was um, it's called the compressed air energy storage and basically means that we take the electricity from the grid when there is too much electricity from the renewables. We use a compressor, we compress the air and then we have to store it somewhere and we were storing this in a mountain. So we had a huge tunnel um, that we had at our disposal. We, we closed the section of this tunnel to huge five meter thick concrete plugs. So these are really massive uh, constructions. And then we put the compressed air into the mountain. You basically keep it in there. And then what you do is when you need the electricity again, you let the air out of this compressed space. It goes through a turbine, it turns the turbine, it produces electricity and you can give it back to the grid. So the concept of storage is you take electricity when there's excess electricity uh, or just the case of, of electricity storage particularly, <clears throat> and you give it back when there is need for electricity. And the, the, the technology I was working on specifically was this compressed air energy storage technology. So I worked on this for a long time until 2017, um, uh, as my from 2012, 13 to 17 as my main activity. Then I started also doing other things. Um, but there, basically, when you develop a electricity storage technology, you also need to see how you can integrate it in the grid. So I had a lot to do with understanding how the grid works, um, how um, how the different markets work and where you can uh, basically sell your storage capacity because there are different kinds of markets, and different uh, kinds of electricity grids specifically for, for storage that are also changing all the time, of course. Um, so basically when I consider myself, as myself a vet veteran, in those fields is because I worked a long time uh, in, in, in those fields. And just before actually switching to Tether, I was working for the local electricity company. And for them, I was doing uh, mainly the long-term infrastructure, infrastructure planning for the energy transition. So basically now uh, lots of countries are going through an energy transition where you want to have more decentralized, more renewable um, energy sources in the grid. And this, of course, has a huge impact on the existing infrastructure. So if you have much more photovoltaic cells on the um, roofs, whereas before you were producing everything on a dam, in the case of Switzerland, 
the way the electricity flows is different. So this impacts how the cables need to be dimensioned. Or when you had a lot of um, gas burners in the houses, um, and now you want to have basically a heating grid that uses more renewable sources, this changes what you need to build in the streets to deliver the heat or the energy to the houses. So this is a quite a complicated issue. It's, it's, a, it's a very long-term issue. So I was doing the planning for the next 30 years to, to, until 2050. Um, and, and this also, again, basically um, combines these two backgrounds that I had um, mm -hmm. into, in, into the energy aspect. But specifically about the energy crisis, I mean, this is much more of a political issue. I mean, it's, it's not really an energy issue. There is, there is not so much of an energy crisis than a lack of foresight crisis and a, a bad planning crisis. I mean, um, it, the problem was that specifically in Europe, energy started to become demonized, um, especially also pushed by politicians. And, and there was this idea that energy is bad and then specifically fossil fuels are bad without, without differentiating anything specifically without looking at the benefits and the costs. And I think this is something that has become more and more prevalent in the world that the lack of nuance and the lack of looking at costs and benefits. So now we see like solar energy is the solution, is good, is perfect, it's only benefits and fossil fuels is only problems and only costs for the environment and for the world and everything. And it's a very superficial way of seeing things, in my opinion, and it's a very dangerous way of seeing things because when you demonize energy, <clears throat> and this is something where, again, unfortunately, like always, countries and places that, that have the, the least access to energy or have the least access to, to wealth in that sense are the ones who are affected the most because uh, when you demonize energy, um, it will become more difficult to access it, um, you put taxes on it, you make it more expensive, uh, you make it uh, generally kind of, um, you, 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 you transmit the idea that it is bad to consume energy, which is totally stupid. Um, actually, the only way to progress for humanity is if we consume more energy. It doesn't mean that we have to waste energy. We need to minimize the waste, we have to maximize the efficiency, but we need to maximize the access to energy um, for making everything that we do faster and easier and more efficient. I mean, you can, you can take a very simple example. I mean, what if from tomorrow nobody uses a washing machine anymore and starts to wash everything with hand? Is that, is that a benefit for the world? Like, I don't think so. Like, we're going to lose so much time washing stuff with hand, probably also in the river or, or, or who knows what. And it's actually even proven that you will use more water for washing uh, clothes with the hand, even if you wash dishes with the hand. So, it, it is very, very, it's a very superficial approach to say that if you consume energy, you're doing something bad for the environment. And I think it's actually the opposite is true. So we should actually, as humanity, try to maximize our access to energy. And, and um, this, is, this is my opinion. And, and the case in, in Europe is really much more of a political one than, than, an, than an environmental one, in my opinion. Okay, okay. And, and in the context of Bitcoin, this political discussion, I think that it is a, a thing that it is happening in all the big countries agenda that in the United States recently we saw a, a bill proposal that is trying to ban or limit the uh, access to energy for Bitcoin mining and this kind of activities. So it seems like this political issue is going through all the main agenda in the globe like it is a geopolitical issue in some way so it should it somehow will impact bitcoin and we are seeing it these uh, days with this kind of bills and the idea of uh, banning uh, proof of work so what are your your thoughts on this do you see that this agenda could uh, change or could influence the discussion and maybe even the the function of the bitcoin system uh yeah no actually i am not worried one bit about bitcoin uh, the good thing the beautiful thing about bitcoin is that it is a it is an international globally distributed perfectly free open network where anybody from any corner of the world can participate to. And this is true for the network as, as to, for transmitting value. And it's also true for, for the mining network. So um, I think the fact that Europe um, 
if look or if Europe bans mining or makes it more difficult, or the US bans mining or makes it more difficult, it ha- I think it will have zero impact on Bitcoin because there is enough jurisdictions that first of all have enough energy, have have excess energy, be it renewable or non-renewable, and and there is enough places in the world that that will arbitrage actually this fact. So if somebody says, ah, like uh, they're banning uh, mining in, in Europe, but that's very good for us because it would be basically at the end of the day easier for us to make money because you have less competition. Um, so so I'm not worried one bit, to be honest, about, about what impact that has on the Bitcoin network itself. Of course, it can have lateral effects because you demonize, again, it's a, it's a matter of demonization. Again, it's cost of benefit. Nobody talks about the benefits of Bitcoin. And this is what is very annoying. So, and we'll talk about this later in Plan B. One of the things that we try to do is have a more objective conversation and informative conversation about what are the benefits of Bitcoin through academia, through media partnerships, through um, programs and TV and so on and so forth. So, but we'll talk about it later. So the problem is again, I mean, nobody talks about what is Bitcoin for. Everybody just says that the, the Bitcoin is bad uh, and energy consumption, consumption is evil. Um, and and uh, it, uh, so, so the lateral uh, damage is that a lot, a big part of society who, who listens basically only to politicians, and, and there is a big part of society who listens only to politicians, unfortunately, not everybody has the, the will or the, the interest to think for themselves a bit. Um, those ones basically were just gonna repeat, and I say, no, the politicians, I mean, they're kind of elected, they represent us, and, and, and uh, they say that Bitcoin is bad, and then we should, we should ban Bitcoin and we should ban uh, mining. So this is the negative effect that, that, that I think I, I, it has. It mainly affects the people in these jurisdictions and the jurisdictions themselves because they will basically, as 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 it's quite quite famously in Bitcoin, we say you can only ban yourself from Bitcoin. You cannot ban Bitcoin. Um, so so the problem is you ban basically your people from Bitcoin, and this is this is not very smart in the long term because it is an open, inclusive monetary system. It's it is going to prevail. I think it's it's quite obvious. I think it's one, it's one of those things that we say in hindsight that it was quite obvious that we need it and that it will prevail um, just simply because it allows everybody to, to interact from any corner of the world. So um, maybe just to, just to answer your question, um, I think it's a pity for, for the regions that, that try to demonize it, but I don't think that it affects Bitcoin, to be honest. I think that, uh, that it is really hard that we see a general ban through all the world because there are in in the global agenda there are more urgent uh, topics and also because uh, Bitcoin opens a kind of arbitrage uh, opportunity to those that have as you said uh, energy that are outside of the them consumption and they can focus that uh, offer through Bitcoin mining and monetize it, so it it builds a different incentive. But I I just wanted to to know your own uh, opinion. So yeah, we we already uh, covered uh, your background and also even your your knowledge about energy and and Bitcoin stuff. So we can go through Tether and your role there. So if you can tell us what are you doing in Tether and how long have you been working with them. Uh, what do you consider that is the the role of this company in the industry? And well, that's that's a really cool, <laughs> really cool job to have, no? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so so I told you about my background, that, and I, I'm a Bitcoiner. Basically, I consider myself a Bitcoiner, and I wanted to work in the Bitcoin space since uh, since many years. Um, I'm not an I'm not a programmer, or <clears throat> I didn't have the typical background that that you have for 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 working in the Bitcoin. Bitcoin space, of course, you could say I could have done something with mining, but the conditions were not there. Uh, let's say um, so. My my general goal is has always been like if I could work on Bitcoin adoption on driving Bitcoin adoption, that would be amazing. Um, and uh, I was basically just uh, just an outsider, a Bitcoiner who was basically spending every three minutes listening to Bitcoin podcasts like yourself. Uh, like yours, and and um, then I saw this announcement from a co- for a corporation called Lugano's Plan B, which is a corporation, a program, uh, and a collaboration between the city of Lugano itself and Tether as a company. So, um, 
this was in March of this year, they published that there's going to be this memorandum of understanding um, that is going to be um, a four year project between these two entities that has a series of initiatives. Like the, you can say the overarching goal is to make Lugano kind of a, a main pole for Bitcoin adoption as well as blockchain technologies um, and and uh, bring more attention to, to Lugano as well from the side of, side of Lugano on, on this topic. Um, and there's also some historic reasons that probably a bit out of scope why Lugano is interested um, to, to have a more significant role. <clears throat> but um, basically I saw that um, this is, I thought it's a very cool project. And I was like, okay, there is, uh, it's, it's mainly about Bitcoin and I want to work in the field. It's basically, I live in Lugano. So it was like, okay, this is basically knocking at my door. Uh, I need to apply for that. And I applied for it. And, and, and here I am, I just started in August. So very fresh, just a month and something that I started this new role and um it's it's very cool it's very nice because um as i said uh i mean tether is a part of a, of a, of a group of companies that that has also other companies that are not directly bitcoin related or or crypto related such as synonym or or heat and these are very interesting companies who are working on on on, on very important issues uh, such as how we interact in the web how we can have direct interactions with the, in, on the web without going through a third party, how we can create a web around ourselves with people that are dear to us without having a centralized co uh, um, company uh, managing everything. This is what basically Synonym is working on with the web of trust and what Whole Punch is working on with the peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, open source platform or protocol for, for communication. So for me, it was like look, seeing all of these things together it gave me basically the confidence that that this could be a very nice nice place for me as a, as a Bitcoin, let's say, to enter and 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 put all of my resources into into driving these these issues ahead. Okay, uh, now I have another question because you said that you live in Lugano, and also you mentioned that Lugano maybe have some kind of inclination or something that may make make the city the a good candidate to to build something like that so you can tell us uh, for 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 first hand what is that yeah. what what does lugano have that it make it uh, so special yeah i mean it's a combination of maybe a, a couple of things um maybe just for a historical background lugano was a very strong uh, banking pole in, in the south of Switzerland that would basically connect the north of Italy with Switzerland and the north of Switzerland um, from a banking perspective. Uh, and it was quite an important part of the industry. I mean, these are facts, so I'm not really saying anything that is not, that is not known. Um, what happened is that in the last 10, 15 years, um, during the Obama administration, um, they basically started to crack down on, on all the banks and everybody who within the slightest, not, um, let's say, uh, follow their, their sanction list or their ideas of, of how transactions and, and, and commerce should work. And this has caused in a lot of fines for a lot of big companies and into lots of uh, capital flowing out of a lot of previous financial markets and financial hubs, which was Lugano was one of them. So it, like in the last 20 years, maybe there was a very strong outflow of, of this kind of activity from Lugano. Um, but Switzerland is a, is a, it's quite a libertarian country generally. Um, I mean, there are always like some kind of tendencies that are worrying always everywhere. But generally speaking, it's, it's quite quite a libertarian place, specifically financially. So it is quite favorable if you want to make experiments on the, on, on the financial side, be it with innovative solutions or, or with traditional solutions. So this, these couple of components, together with the fact that there is an administration in Lugano that are very open and innovative and open-minded, and they have started uh, playing around with crypto already in 2020, where there was the Corona block, uh, lockdown to curb the uh, to to um, basically drive on the, the economy with creating a stable coin uh, called Luga. Um, so there was this background as well from the city itself, and and funnily enough, actually in, in the administration, just a couple of bitcoins as well. Uh, so uh, basically, all of these things came together. To make this cooperation happen and to make it work so that's that's basically what what made this 
place specifically interesting and maybe just to differentiate from another couple of projects that may have maybe are around the around the globe here it's really we have a very strong involvement from the city itself so we have basically we're in daily contact we have weekly meetings with the, with the mayor and his team where we strategize about how to take the plan ahead and, and what is needed and how to best consider the interests of the territory consider the different adoption aspect uh, and so on so it is it is very um very unique in this way the way that it is being taken forward this, this sounds really interesting because uh we're recording this uh, two days after the first year of the bitcoin law in el salvador so we can see that there are uh, different models to to get the adoption and, and all the stuff. So it is really interesting to see uh, what is the strategy and what are the, the perks of, of Lugano in first hand with you. So, so you've been working towards this uh, new hub that is built, is, it's being built in, in Lugano with the Lugano Plan B. So. Can you tell us what is uh, Lugano Plan B and explain us uh, what are the plans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is Plan B, of obviously, they, they, they exactly. will be a lot of uh, good uh, plans. And what are the things that you are doing there? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, so the, the name of the project is called Lugano's Plan B. And it is this cooperation I talked about, and it is for the next four years at least, and then hopefully it will be extended. So it's a four-year project, um, and it has defined a series of initiatives um, that drive ahead Bitcoin adoption and, and crypto and blockchain here in, in, uh, in Lugano. Um, a, a couple of the initiatives have to do with education. So one interesting and cool and very successful um, event we had was during summer. It was called the Summer School. And we had, there was a two week summer school and we had 86 students from 25 countries of the world were here and they were learning about Bitcoin and blockchain and all of these different things and how it works. It was very successful. Um, and we will repeat this again in winter and then every year in summer and in winter. We have um, another important uh, initiative that we have is integrating crypto payments with the merchants, with the local merchants. So I say crypto, but we should, I should clarify that we're not talking about any kind of uh, crypto. It's uh, going to be Bitcoin on Lightning, uh, Tether, and Luga. And Luga is this Lugano stablecoin that the city launched in 2020, so already before us, as, as a way to incentivize and, and drive the local economy during the lockdown that I mentioned before. So it's only these three, these three, uh, um, let's say, cryptos uh, that are going to be introduced to the local merchants. For that, we have already developed the POS device, point of sale device, and we start the pilot project um, in the next couple of weeks. So by the time of the conference, which is end of October, we are already going to have a whole series of, of merchants that are going to um, accept uh, these uh, these Bitcoin, Tether, and, and Luca in their store. <clears throat> and of course, there the challenge, we can talk about the challenges. It's always like, we need to make it as easy as possible for the merchants. So there is accounting issues, there is volatility issues, uh, there is compatibility issues and all of these things. So what we had the privilege, if you want, uh, if you want to say, um, with, what we had the privilege to do is to have, um, of course, the backing from Tether and, and our partners, as well as a specific fund for this, um, for this initiative of 3 million. And this fund basically allowed us to offer services that reduce the volatility risk. So for instance, we offered the merchants to have everything converted immediately to fiat, but it's an option. So, and, and this is again, it, it needs education, right? So we, we, we offer something that has a minimum impact for the merchants at the same time educating them. So going ahead, they will probably, the ones who now want to accept only fiat, in a year, maybe they say, I want to accept maybe 30% of it or 50% of it or whatever of it in Bitcoin, because they can choose between zero and 100% in Bitcoin or in fiat directly converted. Um, and so basically we're really trying to remove all the hurdles for somebody who doesn't know what it is. And basically just, just telling them, this enables you to open to a new set of customers. So giving the options, reducing the downsides, at the same time educating them so in the future we can really have more and more 
Bitcoin integrated into, into society and in, into, into commerce here. So this is one of the initiatives. Um, all of the services of the city uh, will be able to be paid with Bitcoin, Tether and Luga. Um, this is still being rolled out, but you saw it, you see it also in the video. So you're going to, you can pay your taxes with it, you can pay your fines with it, <laughs> you can pay all of the different kind of um, uh, anything basically that you need to pay to the city. You can you are, will be able to pay with Bitcoin um, or Tether or Luga. And and the important thing here is that because there have been a couple of places that started accepting um, crypto, but it has always been manual. So basically you receive it and then they convert it and so on. But here uh, we are, the city is working on integrating it into the financial systems, into the local financial systems of the city. So basically it will become part of the financial infrastructure to be able to receive uh, Bitcoin um, into, in, 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 into their basically financial system. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to hold Bitcoin. They will still maybe convert it. There's a series of legal issues. They, for instance, they can also not hold dollar. Um, in the reserves because it's just a sovereign country with their sovereign sovereign uh, money. Um, but at the same time, it will it really in, a, in an interesting way in the infrastructure, financial infrastructure, allow them to to receive this as part of, of how they offer the services to the to the city. So then we have another initiative that is going to be R&D on mining. So there we are looking into how could we place uh, miners um, in the city that are going to be a benefit on both sides. So most probably maybe using renewable sources or using, or using um, uh, waste energy in some way. And then most importantly, using the heat that is produced during mining to integrate it again in the grid. So here we are building out more and more um, district heating grids. So this basically means tubes with hot water in the ground that take the energy to different houses. And we can integrate perfectly fine the energy, the heat that comes from the miners into this grid to give the heat back to the to, 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 to this kind of grid and heat up the houses or, or produce the warm water for, for, for the houses. Um, and, and these are very important developments, I think, that, that, uh, that uh, we are looking into. It's uh, this is specifically an R&D project. Um, but so, so this is another one. Uh, then another initiative of, of this uh, plan B is to make grants for universities. And this is again, I think it's quite important to, to mention that. So we have to find, I think, a minimum of 500 grants through these four years for local universities, um, but we don't do it kind of unconditionally. <clears throat> One of the challenges that, that there is with academia is that somehow, again, just like with politics, you don't really have coverage of Bitcoin, but you have coverage of blockchains, you even have coverage of blockchains that have some kind of tokens on them. So, and, and this exists because there are some kind of strange relationships between uh, maybe some, some universities and some founders. I mean, there, there are a couple of famous professors around the world who have their own, um, own blockchains, right? They're famous, I don't need to name them. Uh, it's not, it's nothing hidden. And there are kind of, kind of relationships between them. So basically, if you want, there's kind of a, kind of a lobby or, or a marketing approach to, to this. And Bitcoin, as you know, doesn't have a CEO, doesn't have a marketing budget, doesn't have a marketing, te marketing team. So it really is up to people who believe in it um, and who want to really drive this to make sure that this becomes part of the part of the curriculum. So what we do is that we, we define these grants and we always try to define as well to have in an objective and informative manner also having Bitcoin part of the curriculum. I mean, it does not have to be a shill of anything, but there is so much interesting academic stuff on Bitcoin. I mean, we have PhDs written on Bitcoin, so it's not something like uh, that has no academic value. Um, and, and this is something else that, that we are working on, right? So um, trying to integrate more, more objective approach to what Bitcoin is, to what it brings. And the same partnerships we're also trying to do with the media here. So again, media, always has negative tone and, and, and we, for instance, we want to bring them together with all the people who like kind of activists who have always used Bitcoin to overcome financial oppression, to make interviews with them. They tell them how they use Bitcoin to give this kind of new angle to their audience and just give a bit more informative, objective information about Bitcoin to, the, to their people. So. These are maybe the overview of, of some of the initiatives that we have in this plan B. Of course, one of the very important initiatives that we're gonna talk about later, I think in detail, is the plan B forum. 
which is the conference that is going to take place this year to, for the first time. And this is also one of the initiatives that we'll talk about. Yes, exactly. That's exactly my my uh, question. My next question that is about the, the forum itself, because uh, you had um, the forum uh, the forum no the the uh, the summer classes and you have this grants initiative and all seems to be really education driven somehow diffusion driven like to have uh, good information and really great experts uh, invited to the forum so what what are the What are what can you tell us about uh, the Plan B forum? What uh, people that attend could expect, and who are who are attending there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Plan B forum is basically the conference that is going to take place in Lugano on the 28th and 29th of October. So in around uh, one and a half months, and. Um, We have defined three main mottos for the conference, which is Bitcoin and Bitcoin adoption, financial freedom and freedom of speech. Um, and basically the whole agenda is built around these three topics. Um, because again, as I said, we, 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 wanna, we want to again here have the component that opens up Bitcoin to a new audience. So this is why we said, okay, maybe you know about Bitcoin only that it boils the oceans but maybe you're interested in freedom of speech and in financial freedom. So let us tell you concretely about examples and people who use Bitcoin exactly for that. And we invite them to our, to our forum to talk about it. For instance, in this case, we have uh, Fadi Al-Salamin from, from Palestine, an activist from Palestine, who is going to talk about how Palestinians and Israelis use Bitcoin to make um, uh, financial transactions with each other, to do commerce with each other. We have um, Roya Mahbu from Afghanistan that since 2013 has started paying her employees in, in Bitcoin and in this way enabling them really financial sovereignty, um, being, being it in their household or in society that to be able to own their own money and having this kind of uh, liberty and independence. We have Farida Naburema that is going to also talk about her experiences and how she has used uh, Bitcoin as a tool for financial freedom. So, so these are topics like, like a lot of people are interested in, but maybe they don't make the connection to Bitcoin. So this is one of the goals. We say, okay, this is what should interest you. We show you how Bitcoin is exactly aligned with those kinds of ideas and ideologies. The other thing, of course, freedom of speech. Uh, we have, um, we're very proud to have the wife, the father and the brother of Julian Assange at the forum. They're going to be on a fireside chat with Peter McCormack and they will talk about the case of Julian Assange, which is close to us and particularly also now a very important topic because um, uh, he, he, he's being basically, they're trying to send him to US at the end of the day and, and it's something that uh, the family is, is of course trying to avoid from happening. I think it's a very important case and, and, and maybe your listeners probably know that uh, Julian Assange on WikiLeaks was the first probably institutional, if you want to say, user of Bitcoin because in 2011, they got fully cut out of the financial system. You couldn't donate to them anymore with Visa you can, or MasterCard, credit cards. You couldn't donate to them with PayPal. You couldn't donate to them with any banking system. They have been fully cut off from the financial system. And in 2011, they started accepting Bitcoin. And this is basically how they managed to, to, to finance themselves for a long time and still do. Um, and, and unfortunately, his situation has not gotten better, it has gotten worse. So uh, we have here his family members to talk about that case and, and how these things play together. Um, and specifically about the case of Assange, we also going to have two more activities at the forum that go, that, that touch the, this subject. One is that we're going to have the new documentary called Itaka that is going to come out about Julian Assange soon, um, being played in a cinema, in a dedicated cinema next close to the venue, um, that all the attendees and of course also not the attendees can, can, can visit and see. And we are preparing a VR experience for the attendees where they, they can put on the VR goggles, VR headsets, and they're going to find themselves in the room where, in which uh, Julian Assange was uh, basically confined for seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy. 
and then um, you experience how he has been arrested and taken out and put in a high security prison again to bring drive more attention to that. Um, so this is two aspects um, of it. Of course, we're going to talk about nation state Bitcoin adoption. Um, so we're going to have here a representative from El Salvador, Milena Mayorga, the, the ambassador of, of, of El Salvador to, to the US. We're going to have here Indira Campus, Campus, the senator from Mexico. Prince Philip and Samson, who are working on orange pilling countries, basically, um, and they're all going to talk about how is it going with the with the Bitcoin adoption around the globe. Of course, local uh, politicians, representatives that are working on this as well. So this is another angle, and then there is the angle of freedom of speech, um, which is basically kind of supported by the activities of our company, specifically with Hold Punch and Keat and. We probably will not have time to enter that, but it's a very, very important movement. It's a very important topic um, that is also going to be part of the, of the, of the conference. So we talk about how whole punch will enable people to connect directly without going through a centralized server, enabling people to express themselves the way they want, being sure that nobody can uh, can see them and, and look at them, basically, um, and, and how important and what role it plays in the future of digital and, and internet inter interactions, um, which I also personally is, is one of the things that are very close to me. Um, and then, um, so these are basically some of the main topics. Of course, if you go through the list of speakers, you see really the, the OGs. Uh, we, we have Adam Back, we have uh, Nick Szabo, we have Jameson Lop, we have Max Caton. We have really a lot of the top uh, people from the Bitcoin space here present, speeches, panels, or, and this is what we are very um, proud of, uh, master classes. So master classes are basically kind of informational or educational courses of 45 minutes that are going to take place at the same time as a conference in a much smaller setting of maximum 100 people. So um, held by the same top speakers. So this, the names that I mentioned, all of them are going to have masterclass, holding them at their own masterclass. Nick Szabo is going to hold the masterclass on the history of cryptocurrency. Adam Back is going to hold the masterclass on Bitcoin uh, lending and yield. Uh, Jameson Lop is going to hold the masterclass on Bitcoin security and custody. Um, Shift Crypto is going to hold the masterclass on multisig. Um, so very concrete educational topics. Actually, one that is quite, quite cool as well is Raheem Tarizadegan from the Free Cities Association is going to hold a master class on Austrian economics and monetary theory, which I think is very important because it's not taught anywhere. Um, and, and, and the idea of making these master classes and, and providing them to the attendees is to give the attendees the the chance to actually be up close with these with these kind of for many people legendary names um, and being able to have a q a session with them and asking the questions with respect or in contrast to typically a huge stage which you also have but a huge stage where you sit and you look at them and they're on the stage and talking or having a panel which at the end of the day is is something that you cannot really touch and feel so these are two um the two main let's say tracks that we have um at the at the conference then cool thing that we have that I, I think is, is quite interesting, we're going to have a physical Bitcoin art gallery. So it's going to be an art gallery dedicated to physical Bitcoin art. No NFTs and, and Web3 and Metaverse stuff. I have to disappoint the, the fans uh, on that side. Uh, but it's going to be cool, real Bitcoin, Bitcoin art. And, and again, this is something, it's all part of Bitcoin adoption. I see every... I see across the industries, across the globe, people popping up who become Bitcoiners. Like myself, I, I, I'm, I'm, I was neither a, a cypherpunk, if you wish, nor was I a software programmer, nor was I, uh, I don't know, anything adjacent to that. Um, but you start just digging to it and you become more and more of Bitcoiner. And the same with artists. We see now very, even high-end artists who become like very strong Bitcoiners also ideologically, and they start making Bitcoin art and very, very cool stuff, high-end stuff. So we're going to have that at the conference. And of course, what I cannot miss is that we're going to have a Bitcoin meme gallery. So they were going to have the best memes of the Bitcoin, Bitcoin history, because you know that's an important part of the Bitcoin culture. We're going to have them basically displayed and, and, and everybody can look at them, learn, or just become nostalgic with, with all, these, uh, all these different cool memes. That that sounds really good. The the art and memes are really good vehicles to to orange peel people. I've been interviewing people uh, for the podcast like two years ago, but before I was a journalist. So one of the greatest interviews that I did was with Lucio Poleri, that is a Bitcoin artist, and 
the background of the artist's work is really interesting. And in terms of Bitcoin uh, logos, the way that we communicate Bitcoin, it is really interesting how, the, how they see things. So it is really good to have this in the conference and also being able to link a conference that is mainly about Bitcoin and, and the, the impact it could have in the society is really interesting to link it to the freedom of speech. And I think that it will be a really nice uh, conference. So I want to ask you about the tickets because maybe our audience here in Satoshi in Venezuela is not that uh, European, but uh, uh, maybe we can reach people that want to attend and and stuff like that. So what what are the way to go to this forum and how how how, how much time is left before we le we get left out of the <laughs> of the tickets? Yeah. So so actually regarding the tickets. Uh, we just announced last week a very strong price reduction of, of the ticket price. Um, it was basically also based on feedback from, from, from the society mainly because, and again, we want to really invite also new people. So here you can see the prices. We want to invite new people who are curious and not only enthusiasts. So maybe if you're a super Bitcoin enthusiast, you have no problem paying 400 tickets for 400 francs, which is, by the way, now the same as dollar and euro. They're all the same, basically, at this point. You don't want to pay maybe 400 euros for a general ticket to go. Or, or, or actually, if you if you are a Bitcoin enthusiast, you do want to pay 400 euros to go and see Nick Zabo and Adam back. But if you're not, you probably won't. Um, so so the, for us, it was important to say, OK, since we want to open the door to new people, to curious people, and we have this adjacent kind of topics as well that we're going to talk about, let's make the ticket price in a way that allows us to, um, allows everybody basically to participate with, 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 with not so much of a, of a financial burden. Um, and therefore, we talked with our sponsors, we talked with our partners, and, and, and basically we said, uh, let's everybody basically put Put, put our strengths together and, and make another financial push in order to allow us to reduce the ticket prices. And, and we had great support from, from our partners and sponsors in that. So we basically managed to reduce the ticket prices um, to basically the, the main, the general ticket pass is now gonna cost half. So it was around 400 francs and now it's only 199, 499 euros. Um, if you're a student, it's going to cost only 99 euros. And these two tickets, you should know that give you already access to everything. Um, so everything except the parties in the evening. So of course we needed to make a differentiation to be able to cover the costs by, by making a, a, another ticket, which is the all access ticket, which also has been reduced from 999 to 699. And that one uh, gives you also access to all of the side events and everything else. Um, but you want to say, okay, if you're interested in the in the in, in the content, um, we think 200 francs, 199 francs and euros, dollars is a reasonable price for what you're offering, um, considering the high level of, of the speakers from the Bitcoin space and from outside the Bitcoin space. Um, and this was the mainly mainly the main idea of of of, of um, why we reduce the price, and we are great, really very grateful to the partners that we could actually do that. So this this um, let's say uh, promotion is going is going on now since uh, since a week, and it will last um, as long as basically our part of financial help lasts. Uh, so first come first serve. Um, but basically, we hope that like this, we we can have more more people coming to the conference. Yes, I think that it is a good way to to open to a more big audience and also to incentivize people that are already uh, bought by the event and the level of the speakers to uh, go and, and get more more involved like uh, have these uh, tickets that allows you to go through uh, the post events and, and all the stuff that that is really cool in the in the events and uh, I, I I don't know how to how to close because we already covered everything and and also we already invite people to to attend but maybe if 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 we can do something more related to to people like me like i'm in venezuela i'm attending because of paolo ardoino because he he's 
really uh, ag but uh the people that is maybe in in developing uh, markets but are really interested in in bitcoin and they are also adding value and see this as an opportunity to to meet with this a uh, creme of bitcoin uh, societal and cultural movement and also with uh, a lot of high, high value speakers and i don't know if if you are planning to live stream to do some more accessible through the internet uh, contents i don't know if if there are something for this mm -hmm. kind of profiles Yes, absolutely. Everything that that is going to happen at the conference, um, be it in the main stage or in the master classes, will be published online afterwards for everybody to see. So um, obviously, it would be strange if we say that we want to be all inclusive and have everybody on board, and then say no, you only can see this when you, if you, if you, if you're here. Of course, we might not live stream it uh, for 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 several reasons, but. After the event, we are going to um, publish the material <clears throat> online for the people around the world. I mean, you know, it's maybe not going to be exactly the same experience. Um, so, so if you want to have the real, real experience, uh, you should uh, make the effort to come to the to the conference. Um, but then again, if you if you really can't because you live in Latam or or any other any other corner of the world, then it's too honors for you to come. Um, there will be the chance to basically see all of the master classes and all of the speeches um, all that happened um, later online. Well, perfect. That That is a good way to invite the people to get in touch with what will happen in Lugano and Lugano Plan B. And thanks a lot, Gif, uh, for, for being here with us. And we are also adding your socials and the socials of the uh, event and, and Plan B to the uh, show notes. And thanks a lot for your time. And also always welcome to Hablemos de Bitcoin. Thank you very much. It was very nice to be here. I hope to be back when we have some more results from our orange peeling efforts here in Lugano. <laughs> yes, that will be awesome. And I, I will probably do a special cover there in, in, in Switzerland and will yes. be nice to give you a nice hug, a Venezuelan yes. hug. <laughs> yes, I'm looking very much forward to it. Thank you, man. Well, Thank thanks you very a lot. Much. Thanks a lot for listening to us and remember that this show is sponsored by Leden.io, Holo Holo and Beat Recruit.